The summer drought of 2007 allowed scientists and archaeologists in Florida to look through a window into the state's past and uncover hidden treasures just below the surface of Lake Okeechobee. Okeechobee is the nation's second largest lake. Because of the drought, because of the drought, the, the lake hit its lowest levels on record. In some areas, the shoreline reached more than a mile, creating areas of dry lake bed where historical artifacts have been uncovered, with some dating back 500 years or more. Pottery shards, arrowheads, weaving tools, and pendants now lay on top of the dry ground, providing clues about the Native Americans that lived in the area hundreds of years ago. Evidence of Florida tourism and fishing industries also lurk nearby, including a fishing trawler from 1904 that probably sank during the hurricane of 1928, and evidence of paddle boats that once ferried tourists around the area. All of these items have rested just beneath the surface of the water for many years. It took a drought to bring them into the light of day. About five years ago, a group of us were at the Mesa Verde National Park. I was talking with a park ranger there. Mesa Verde is in the southwest corner of Colorado and it's home to the Anastasi people who built the Pueblos or the cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde is an amazing place that holds some of the most ancient structures and ruins that you will find in North America. The area around Mesa Verde was experiencing a drought as well, the park ranger told me, and during that drought, someone's campfire got away from them and ignited a blaze that burned hundreds of acres, fueled by dry brush and scrub trees. The fires were devastating. But after the fires died down and they had regained control of the park, the ranger told me that even more ancient dwellings, dwellings they had no idea even existed, were soon discovered and ready for additional exploration and investigation. Now I share those stories with you because they lead us into thinking about what happens beyond the calamities and catastrophes of our lives. Drought and fire, literal or metaphorical, are among the many kinds of times that try and test us. Dry seasons, recessions, depressions, times of plant closings close to home, these are times of trial and testing. Could it be that there are treasures to be found in those times of trial and testing, like at the bottom of Lake Okeechobee? or on the table-like plains of southwestern Colorado. Is it possible for us to learn a new lesson or two from these difficult and demanding times, times to which all of us are called now and then? The prophet Elijah was on the run. He had called down a drought upon the land because of King Ahab's sin. He was the target of Queen Jezebel's anger. He had been hiding out in the wilderness where ravens brought him food to eat, drinking water from a brook until the brook dried up because of the drought he had called down. All in all, you really wouldn't want to go on vacation with Elijah. But then the word of the Lord comes to Elijah, and the prophet is told to go to Zarephath, where God has already planted within a Phoenician woman's heart a seed, a seed of compassion, to feed him. Now, whenever you read the word widow in the Bible, you can assume that it also means poor and powerless. Widows had no one to provide for them. There was no social security net. They were on their own to scratch out whatever existence they could. To a single mother, a widow, Without power, without provision, without promise, living in dangerous and idolatrous times, Elijah was sent. Elijah found her gathering sticks to build a small fire on which she was planning to cook her final meal. Bring me some water, he said to her, and while you're at it, bring me a little something to eat. 
seen his trouble. Here was Elijah, a Hebrew prophet, begging a meal of a Phoenician widow who was powerless and penniless. As the Lord your God lives, she says, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and only a little oil in a jug. I'm now gathering a few sticks so that I can go home and prepare what I have for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. The words are filled with pain and desperation. She knows her situation, and her situation is dire. The jar is nearly empty. What she has will not last or sustain her. The end is at hand. She does not know that Elijah has come to her, not for a meal, but to share good news. Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Boy, when you see that in the scriptures, pay attention. Here it comes. The jar of meal will not be empty, and the jug of oil will not fail until that day when the Lord sends rain on the earth. The God of Israel has not forgotten you, woman of Phoenicia. The God of Israel never forgets the poor. The God of Israel does not forget those whom the world forgets or, those, or ignore those whom the world chooses to ignore. Even in the time of calamity, especially in the time of calamity, in the time of drought, metaphorical, spiritual, or economical, even and especially when the days are filled with trouble and bad news, when your jar is nearly empty, God is near. And God has an endless supply. 